Eurogold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Eurogold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. Lollavita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian style dishes, using the best ingredients, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. Supreme Upholstery Limited is a manufacturer of quality bespoke upholstered furniture. Come along with your ideas for that perfect sofa to fit your home and let Supreme bring your ideas to fruition. We also offer a service to the contract market, including large hotel groups and small family-run business. No matter how large or how small your order, you will always get that personal service from our sales team. Come along and visit our showroom. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. This week we're doing a tribute show in memory of John Brennan who passed away very suddenly a few weeks ago. We'll be chatting to some of his family and friends. John was very well known not just in Manchester but all over the country. John and his partner Sharon played at all big celebrations including festivals, weddings, anniversaries and birthday parties. And no matter what song you wanted, John made sure he played it for you. John came from Tubbercurry in County Sligo. He immigrated to Manchester many years ago, worked for a few different companies before he started his own haulage company, which he ran with great success. Then John decided to change it all and start his own disco business called GIB Disco. We are going to join John's lifelong friend, Pat Freely, to find out a little bit more. Now there's a man called Brennan. He's a man of high renown. He's in the disco business in Manchester town. He had a load of wagons. I'll change all that city. I think I'll start the disco. And I'll call it J.I.B. We were uh, born in the same area over near Tubbercory in County Sligo. And we went to the same school, even though I was a little bit older than John. Uh, I think I was in fourth class when John started school. And uh, about 1950, I would say, the school changed from being a mixed to all boys on one side, all girls on the other. So it was all boys at that time when John started. And uh, at playtime, the teacher would ask us, you know, to look out for the, in the small lads in case they'd run away or run out on the road. So we did. And we'd be playing football, but John was never uh, interested in playing football. He'd be in the bike shed, fixing the bikes and looking at bikes and all that. And then he'd get trouble with the teacher when he'd go in because there'd be all oil on his hands. What was he like growing up? And I heard a lovely story about him recently, changing the handlebars on his bike and stuff like that. Oh yes, in later years. Well, actually, uh, their house was about, we'd say, two and a half miles from the school. And as he got bigger, the parents bought him a bicycle. So he decided to take the handlebars off the bike and put a steering wheel of a car on the bike. He thought, but he had no brakes because he took the brakes <laughs> off. So his foot was the brakes. And he nearly had a few accidents with that. But uh, that was the way. He was always interested in um, stuff like that, you know, bicycles. Then he went on to uh, a motorbike. And he'd have to take that apart to see how it worked and then put it back together again. And then, of course, he immigrated from Sligo to Manchester. 
and you were there again to guide him and support him. Yeah, well, I, uh, I left in 1962 myself, uh, uh, in June 1962. And, uh, well, John, uh, when he left school, he started to work. He was working, there's two creameries, one either side of Tubber Collie, and he worked in both. And he had no interest in farming. The father wanted him to stay on the land, but he wouldn't. He had no interest in the land, so he rang me in the spring of 1967 and he says, I think I'll come over to Manchester. I says, fine. So he rang me again to tell me when he was coming. I says, by the way, have you got a suitcase? No, I've got a flower bag. <laughs> no, I says, that's no good. I says, you want to get a suitcase and put your clothes in a suitcase and, you know, so he did. And he came over and uh, I picked him up at the station and got him a place to stay and got him a job and set him up. And uh, I used to go down to see him regular when he came over first to make sure he was all right. Now, he wasn't a very good cook, but he soon mastered it after a while. He had a good appetite. And he used to write home a few lines uh, regular and send a few pounds to the mother and father and, and his sister Mary over in Tubbercurry. He was always interested in machinery though. When he had his own company and his own wagons and everything, he was able to repair every single wagon he had. Oh yes, and even the tires. He used to re retread the tires of, of the wagons and did it for other companies as well. And he, oh, he, he never got a mechanic or anything like that to uh, service the wagons or the cars or anything like that. He actually had a car before he came to England which there wasn't many cars about that time. And he left it to his dad and his dad learned to drive. And then of course he turned to fundraising and he'd done so, so much fundraising for the Christie Hospital. And he helped out so many other people and you made him a lovely cottage for one of his fundraisers. Oh yes, uh, well, uh, when he started the fundraising, he, uh, he got me involved, let's put it that way. And uh, we supported him as best we could and he, he raised a lot of money for uh, Chris, the Christie, and I used to make things for him for the, um, you know, for the auction and all that. So we we always did well on it. I know you're going to miss him an awful lot because, of course, you were childhood friends, and you had great friendship here in Manchester all those years. And I know he used to call you a lot and tell you where he had been and what he was doing. Yeah, he kept in contact all the time. He'd come up to the house and. Uh, and with this COVID going on, he wouldn't, he wouldn't come inside the gate. He'd park the van outside and we'd have a chat and, and, and all that type of stuff. And he'd be telling me where he, wh what he had planned for the future. And he had, uh, he had bookings for next year, actually. It was a great testimony to him that so many people turned up at his funeral from all around the country on a very cold day. It was lovely to see so many people there. And uh, it was a great turnout on the day. We'll miss him. He'll be missed in Manchester, not just by me, hundreds of people for his uh, music. He knew how to uh, get the people on the floor. He had every tune under the sun you could think of. Well, if he didn't have the music, he'd get it. Yeah. He never let anybody down that way. He knew a lot about, uh, especially country and western. He knew a lot about music. And he was a great dancer, you know, in his young days. Yeah. And he danced waltz, quick step, jive, and anything. Sadly, Miss Pa, thank you so much for joining us on the show and telling us all about John. OK, Martin, thanks very much. Jacqueline, it must have been a horrible shock to you and all your family when you realised your dad had passed away so suddenly. Oh, it was a, ter a terrible shock. Um, we thought he was coming home. Um, the doctors actually thought, he could, even though he was so sick, um, and it wasn't my dad, my dad turned his phone off in the hospital once he was in there. And with corona and everything, we wasn't able to go and see him. And he rang me and I said, what have they done? So he said, I've had this procedure. Um, they, said, they said I'm going to die. So I said, did they? So he said, yeah. So I said, when? So he said, in the next 30 years. Now that's my dad, with my dad being my dad, with his, with his humour. And of course, the really sad thing is, is that nobody could get in to see him due to the virus and everything. And it was so shocking. He knew so many people all over the country and all over Ireland, and yet, he died with nobody with him. That was really sad. Oh, it, it, it's terrible. It, honestly, it's terrible. Like, I, ha I had a relative in the hospital who was visiting him because she worked there and they were allowing her on the ward to, to, to see him. 
and she was just saying, Jackie, your dad looks, your dad looks like weak and old, and he's not, he's not able for stuff. And I, I was like, we were in shock, and she said, she said one day he was crying, like I've never seen my dad crying all my life, and, and she said he was really upset this one day. So I said, God, what's wrong with him? So she said, she, she, he, he's just not well. Himself and Sharon. They played at so many gigs up and down the country. Everybody knew them from London to, you know, Liverpool. Uh, they were so well matched, if you like, in the music, and they entertained so many people. Oh, they did. They were they were great company for one another. They both enjoyed the the same things. If it wasn't the music, it was the allotment. If it wasn't the allotment, it'd be the dogs. They just great company for one another. You know, he had a lot of family here, but his sister was here, Mary, and different members of the family. And I think he always kept in touch with them. Him and his sister were very, very close, yeah. Tell me what your dad was like when you were growing up. Oh, God. My, my dad, oh, my dad, you would all probably know what my dad was like. He was one thing, always taking the mick. Um, such good fun, but obviously we didn't find it fun at times. <laughs> if he got something in his bonnet, he'd be saying, have you seen this? Have you ever seen this? Like, we'd say, yeah, Dad, we, we have seen it. We, like, we'd know. But he'd say, like, because he'd got a grip of it, he'd find it dead funny, like. He gave up so much of his life though in recent years to raise money for the Christie Hospital here in Manchester. He raised, I think, over £21,000 in a short period of time. And uh, he put his heart and soul into that. Oh, he loved it. He couldn't get enough of it. and he. He was. He couldn't wait for the next one. He couldn't wait for the next one. He just. He. He loved organising and getting people together for such a good cause, and he would collect all the money in, and because he'd be working, he'd say, "Will you go down and put it in? Make sure you get a receipt so I can put the receipt out for everybody to see." He. He loved doing it, and he just couldn't wait to get out there and do another one and get everybody together again. Well, Jacqueline, do you know, we've had so many people contact us from all the places you used to play all around the country. And you won't know them, but they know of you. And they wanted to send all the sincere condolences to you today, um, you know, about your dad passing away. Because he was so well liked, he had fun with them all, and he'd really done a great job in entertaining people. Oh, I the amount of support like that we've all had like i see i've seen all the messages and throughout and people ringing different people oh i can't tell you how much support we've had and how many stories that people have got to tell and it's the same ones that we know of my dad but we didn't realize he knew as many people as what he did may he rest in peace because he was a good man on this earth and i'm sure he'll do a good job on the next world as well oh please we, we can only hope i hope he's up there dancing away and playing music with the angels <laughs>
Welcome back. This week we're doing a tribute show in memory of John Brennan who passed away suddenly a few weeks ago. Now when John was 70 he arranged a big birthday party at the Leeds Irish Centre. It was a great night and the entertainment was provided by Dominic and Barry Kerwin. John didn't want any presents but he asked everybody if they would like to make a little donation to the Christie Hospital. John, of course, we're here for a very special occasion. You're doing a fundraising dance for the Christie Hospital, but it's also your birthday. Yeah, I'm trying to do it on my 70th birthday as well for the, for the occasion, so I said, let's get the lot in together and hopefully... Between, I don't want any money presents or anything like that. I just want donations towards the Christie's. And Tommy McLaughlin and Barry Kerwin gave you a lovely cake on stage. They did, because it was grand, so it was that cake, so it was, yeah. And a microphone on it and speakers and a mixer and the lot. And you've raised quite a bit of money all together for the Christie, all haven't you? Together I've raised £21,888.43. pence. That was up to me. So I, whatever comes out here tonight now will be on top of that. Well, so. Of course, the Christie Hospital does wonderful work for so many people that's ill and, you know, they look after everybody so well. Well, they do, yeah, and it's, uh, you know, the people in Manchester is blessed to have that hospital so close to them. They don't have to travel. Lots of people have to travel a long p distance to, to attend that hospital where we have it on our doorstep. And it's great to have it there, and it's grand to be able to help them out and hope we'll never need them. Happy birthday to What a great night that was. Over three and a half thousand pounds was raised for the Christie Hospital. Now we're going to meet John's very best friend for over 50 years. That's Liam Goodwin. I met John in 1967, Merton, when he was working for the North Midlands Construction Company. We became great friends after that, and we used to go to the pubs and clubs together at weekends. We used to go to the George and All Saints, the Crown and Everton Road, and the Big Plymouth and Plymouth Grove. And after the pubs closed, we used to go to the college club, which became the Air 3, and the Astoria, which became the carousel in later years. Oh, they were great Irish places at that time, Liam. They were packed with people every weekend. And then I, I believe you lived together for a while. That's right, Merton. We, I li lived in Plymouth Grove and Lodging House, which John lived in for about two years. And then I was working for a company called P. Inright from Yorkshire, and I got a job there for John driving a wagon. And John was a very hard worker. In the evenings, after he'd finished work, he used to work from home in his own garage, cutting tires and fixing punctures for lads with their own wagons. And then eventually he bought his own lorry. Then he, he, he bought his own lorry and started his own business successfully. Then during that time, he worked at the Airdrie as well, I believe. That's right. He, he, he went working as doorman on the Airdrie with Johnny Cohn and um, Big Eamon uh, and Johnny Clark was the three men that I used to know on the door at that time and he, he, he enjoyed it there for a long time, John did. I was John's best man in, in Ireland in 1974 when he got married and he also was godfather to my son Stephen. Oh, you've got such lovely happy memories. I've got, I've got great memories for 50 years with John and, and uh, I will never ever forget them. Yeah, they will go on forever. And of course he turned his career upside down then and he became the mighty GIB. That's right, Martin. He went into the disco business and called it the mighty GIB. And wh what a disco man he was. He was the best ever I heard. Yeah, yeah. And your brothers knew him well, didn't they? That's right, Martin. Uh, my brothers in Ireland, Sean and P Podrick now, they lived in Manchester years ago, but they knew John very well. And Podrick, when he was here in Manchester, he used to travel with John to his gigs up to Preston and Leeds. They taught the world to John. Yeah. I know the day of his funeral, you met a lot of his friends, a lot of people you hadn't seen for a while that turned out to see him. It was great to see so many people come along and pay tribute to him. It was brilliant altogether and the only thing was that 
with the COVID that we couldn't give him a real send off in the club afterwards. John was my very best friend for 50 years. I have brilliant memories of John that will live on forever. Rest in peace, John. John used to go to da travel for miles to dance halls and marquees, especially if there was a good band on. He introduced me to his friends and showed me all around Manchester. I believe he was um, interested in getting you a car as well. Yes, he, he um, paid for me to have driving lessons. And when I passed my test, he bought me a car, which was a Ford Anglia, for £70. Now, Bellevue, of course, was such a popular place back in the day. There was so much used to go on there. And I believe you and John used to visit Bellevue. John and his friends uh, every now and again used to go to White City to watch the stock car, and he took me along as well. Now, you must find it very difficult uh, with John passing away so suddenly. Yes, I uh, find it a, a big shock and it's hard to come to terms with it. But I have a, a marvellous family and lovely friends that help me through. Now, John was cremated. Tell me about his ashes. Uh, John always said he would like his ashes to be spread around the house where he was born in Ireland. My mum lived to be 103. Uh, when she was 100, we had a great big party for her. John set up a marquee in the front garden. He took all his music equipment back from Manchester and played music for a big party for mum. My dad um, was 73 when he passed away. He was a great dad to both me and John. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for all their good wishes, messages of condolences, mass cards, and um, all the people that made sure that John got a good send off. Um, may John rest in peace. Now there's a man called Brennan. He's a man of high renown. He's in the disco business in Manchester town. He had a load of wagons. I'll change all that said he. I think I'll start the disco and I'll call it J.I.B. Well, he takes it to the Wally and up to Preston town. With the best of sound and music, he'll never let you down. He goes to Tubber Curry. Ah, but only for the crack With J.I.B. at the steering wheel And the disco in the back Inside of his Ducato Is a sight to behold There's a double bed and a telly And a heater if you're cold There's even a fridge freezer And a kettle for the tea It's my little home away from home Says the mighty J.I.B. Well, he takes her to the Wally and up to Preston Town With the best of sound and music He'll never let you down He goes to Tubber Curry Ah, but only for the crack With J.I.B. at the steering wheel And the disco in the back At 9 p.m. on a Saturday The landlord wore a frown The pub was stuffed with people And the band had let him down With everyone complaining what can I do, said he, I'll be there in 20 minutes, said the mighty J.I.B. Well, he takes her to the Wally and up to Preston Town. With the best of sound and music, he'll never let you down. He goes to Tubber Curry, ah, but only for the crack. With J.I.B. at the steering wheel and the disco in the back. He does funerals, wakes and weddings, christenings and barbecues. From the pretty little girl from Oma to get off my blue sweat shoes. He's the pride of Tubber Curry. And so it seems to me, if you're looking for a disco, ring the mighty J.I.B. Well, he takes her to the Wally 
and up to Preston Town with the best of sound and music. He'll never let you down. He goes to Trouble Curry, ah, but only for the crack. With J.I.B. at the steering wheel and the disco in the back. Now they built a fine big airport in a place that's known as Knock. And on the day they opened it, they played hip hop and rock. What's this, says Father Horton? That's not the stuff for me. Get your man from Tubber Curry. Get the mighty J.I.B. Well, he takes you to the Wally and up to Preston Town. With the best of sound and music, he'll never let you down. He goes to Tubber Curry, ah, but only for the crack. With J.I.B. at the steering wheel and the disco. In the bank. It's been a very difficult time for John's family and everyone who knew him. And a big thank you to everyone who supported John and the Christie Hospital down the years. May he rest in peace. Now that brings us to the end of the show for this week. Henry McGlade is back with his show next Thursday evening at 7 o'clock from County Mayo. And we are here as usual with the Irish in the UK at 7.30. Until then... Thank you for watching and take good care of yourselves.